something really interesting happened to me last week. I had four different people reach out to me for advice on their game projects. All four of them were building systems and they felt like things were starting to go sideways with the architecture. And the symptoms with all of these projects was the same. The inheritance hierarchy was starting to get out of control with some of their class structures. So today I want to talk about one of the foundational principles of software architecture, which is to favor composition over inheritance. And we're going to take a look at what that looks like and we'll do a little bit of refactoring. Things will get progressively more advanced as we go along and I've got some good tips for you at the end. Everybody is familiar with this sort of thing where we have a base abstract class, say a vehicle, and we start extending that with types that make sense, a car, a truck. Of course, those are both vehicles. But what happens when we start having things like a black car? Does our hierarchy continue to make sense? Or is something starting to go sideways here? One method that can help you build good hierarchies of inheritance is to use is a and has a. A car is a vehicle, but a car has a color. In fact, all vehicles have colors. This simple little trick can really help when you're designing systems. Why don't we add one more thing that belongs to a vehicle? How about an engine? So all vehicles have engines, but the engine itself has its own properties. So I would represent that as its own class. And here, Copilot has already filled in that it has a horsepower. That makes sense. So your class names define what this sort of thing is, whereas the members of your class define its behavior and its properties. Remember that any sort of class can also have a type of behavior. Now, I want to look at a slightly more complex example that's based a little bit on what one subscriber asked me about and something that I've been working on for myself. So a very simple version of a resource gathering system might start with an enum of a whole bunch of different types of resources. We might define a base node that's just going to have an abstract method that will return the resource type that this node represents. So we might start building up an inheritance hierarchy with a stone node, just return that type. We could go a little further and make one for a tree, maybe an oak node. Now, one of the questions that was posed to me is, what if we want this type to actually represent more than one type of element? This might work something like when we harvest the base elements, we have a chance to get a special item on some nodes. So for that, we might extend our base node class with a special node abstract class. And then we start making a little bit more complex nodes out of that. So for example, maybe we have an iron node here and our special gather met method could return the iron, but we also need the iron node to return a base type. So we also need to start overriding our regular gather method here and maybe it just returns regular stones perhaps. So you can probably see how this sort of structure, the inheritance hierarchy, is going to get out of control very quickly. So at this point, you can think, what do all of these things have in common? What are they? What is the is a uh, in this case? Well, they're all nodes. The only difference between them is the type. So let's wipe this out and start over. Now a node has a type. Let's define that as a member. Now at this point we might say, okay, it's probably a good idea to also make one for the special node that overrides the base node. But if we look at these, what's really different here? If I were to leave this in this state, the consumer of these nodes is going to have to do some casting to figure out whether or not the node is special or not. What if we just combine these two into one and then we could say optionally, we could have a special resource type, but it could just be empty as the default, right? So I can just remove this bit and just switch these around a little bit so they're a little bit more readable. But this could really be our base class. But let's think about this a little bit more. Does the base node have a resource type or does it actually have a resource? It really does have a resource that we want to pass around and we're probably going to want to know how much of it we're passing around. We might want to know a few other things too, but we could start with this. And so with that in mind, we can actually just change all of these up here to be resources. I'll just give them some slightly better names here. Now, ideally, the resource itself is going to represent a resource in our game, but there's static data associated with that that we might want to configure with a scriptable object. So why don't we make another class, resource config? This way, we'll be able to set up any fields we want to be configurable inside of Unity, and then we could have a public method here that will just create our runtime resource for us. I'll just call it generate, and I'll let it create a new resource for us. For the time being, I'll just set these resource fields to be public. 
In Rider, if you press control twice and hold it down on the second press, you can press up and down and it'll give you multi-cursor. You can do the same kind of thing in VS Code with Alt-Click. Okay, moving on. We can come back up here to our base node and just make some serialized fields for these. So we can call them resource config and special resource config. Then in our awake method, we can just use the public method that we just created to assign references to these. So now at this point, do we even really need an abstract class? Probably not. This one class is going to handle exactly what we needed to get out of all those other classes we started with. All we really have to do is have an implementation for both of the methods. And that's it. That's a very simple system that should do what we need. I'm going to move the scriptable object into its own file and just add an annotation here so we can create them in Unity. Now, just because I removed all of the inheritance here, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right thing to do all the time. There are no absolutes in this. You know, you got to figure out what's going to work best for your situation. Sometimes you can get it down to really needing no inheritance. Generally speaking, any system you build in C Sharp is going to use both inheritance and composition. You just need to figure out which parts are the is a and which parts are the has a. So I created a few object definitions. I'm just going to go over to this rock in my scene here. And why don't we just add the base node onto here and we can give it some details and see what happens. And just make sure it's all working before we jump into the next part here. So for this node, let's put stone in as the base resource and the special resource can be gold. Now I might have to add a little bit of code to my hero so I can actually call the gather methods on this object. Uh, but to, first let's put a capsule collider on here just so that we can actually interact with it in a very simple way. Um, I'll flip that on there and just uh, adjust it a little bit here. Just make it a little bit narrow. It doesn't really matter for this, I suppose. And then let's just uh, jump back into code and we can add a little bit to the hero class. So I can probably just let Copilot figure this one out for the most part. But basically, we can have a harvest method and we can just check for anything around us. We can use a overlap sphere for this, maybe a radius of about five. So we can walk up to it and press a key and see what happens. So for every collision, let's check for a base node. No base node, we just continue. Otherwise, we're going to gather the first resource. If the first resource is type empty, we continue. And if it wasn't empty, let's also get the special resource. Now in our update method, we could just say, if we've pressed, let's say the F key, then we'll just try to harvest. Yeah, that's simple enough, that'll work. Let's jump back into Unity, recompile and click play. All right, so I'm just going to stroll over to this little rock here, press F, and let's see what happens. Boom. Got the stone, got the gold. Perfect. It's working just the way we'd expect. Now, is there any way we can make this even simpler? Yes, there is. <laughs> let's go look at it. So the thing that's bothering me about this still is that we have two public methods here and we have to call them one right after the other. What's the point of this? Now, if you were building some kind of public API that other people, other programmers would be consuming, you'd probably want to be very clear with your intent here and you might want to make a struct and pass both uh, resources back together. But this is also a great opportunity to introduce the concept of tuples to those people who have never seen this before. You can pass back more than one value as a return type if you put it into parentheses. So if I want to pass back both resources, I can do it like this, and then I just pass them back again in parentheses one after the other. Now, this isn't very clear. How's the person calling this method supposed to know what any of these things are? It's kind of tricky, right? And this is precisely why people don't like using tuples in a public API, as if someone else is going to be using your code. Well, let's see what happens. I'll just wipe all of this out and let's call the node.gather method and store that in a new variable. So I'll just wipe this out. I'll say, now we'll call it all resources equals node.gather. And now you can see in the hint here, it just says resource, resource. That is not very helpful, right? <laughs> but there's more about tuples we can do. Why don't we go back over to our node? You can actually give these a name here. So the name can be anything you want. I'm just going to use the same name as the member names. So let's go back to the hero and see what that looks like in the hint now. So you can see I've got both the names there. So both of our resources have been destructured into this new struct all resources. 
as children of that. So we can reference them just with dot notation now, put them into their own variables or do whatever we want. So that's a little bit more useful to us. Why don't we explore this just a little bit further, just to have a really good understanding of tuples as a return type. So if you don't want them to actually go into a struct and then reference them by dot notation, you could actually do something like this. You can mimic the return type from the function and destructure them right into variables that you want. And then you can go on using them after this. Now, there is shorthand for this too. So we could say instead of resource here, we can just say var. Um, we could say var on the first one. And if they're all going to be the same type, you can say var at the front. And that would make it even shorter. Now, when destructuring like this, I don't have to use these specific names. There's no compiler enforcement on this at all. I could say var 1, 2, and that would work perfectly fine. But, you know, for me personally, I think I like this way the best. You've got a little struct that you can use dot notation on and do whatever you want. So, you know, just as a test, why don't we make sure it's working? I'll just add some debug statements here, or rather, I'll let Copilot do it. Now, the next time we press play, we should get two messages, same as before. Maybe one more thing before we go, I'm just going to hover over the type of the struct so you can see what it is here. It's actually a system.valueTuple of type resource, comma, resource. So let's leave tuples for now. I want to come back just briefly to the inheritance versus composition. Now, the principle says to favor composition over inheritance. But of course, you're going to use both almost all the time. Just trying to keep these tips in mind. Use inheritance when there's a clear is a relationship and the subclass is a more specific form of the superclass. Use composition when there's a clear has a relationship. Then you can combine your properties and behaviors into whatever part of your inheritance hierarchy makes sense. Don't be afraid to refactor your code at any point when you start to sense that things are going sideways. Before we wrap it up for today, I want to show you one more thing that I like to do sometimes and it might help you out. I know a lot of you are building bigger systems. What I'll sometimes do is come over to ChatGPT and just ask it to build me a plant UML diagram for all the code that I paste in. And this works great too if you're just trying to understand someone else's system. Now the output is going to be something that I can copy and paste into the plant UML website on the homepage of plantuml.com. Now you can just paste it into the box at the bottom of the page and it's going to output you this nice UML diagram. So for those of you that are a little bit more visually oriented. This can be an extremely helpful tool. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Click on one of these boxes on your screen if you're interested in more intermediate advanced Unity C Sharp.